welcome to Agora Digital Art. Uh, I'm Matt Harvey, the Community Specialist for Agora, and thanks for joining us at our Immersive Atmospheres uh, Digital Approach to Spatial Practice. At this event, we're going to be talking about specialising the online art world at a time of social distancing, and we're going to be chatting with the team behind The Plot, an online gallery bringing spatial sensibility to the world of online art and online communication, as well as one of their featured artists, Rebecca Van Beek, an emerging scenographer from South Africa. So now I'm going to hand over to our moderator for today's event, Aliandra. So uh, over to you, Aliandra. And without further ado, it is my great pleasure to introduce the people behind this fascinating collaboration. Alex Kutzi, who's an architect and quite a 21st century artist entrepreneur with an iPhone and a GPS running watch. He's interested in the aesthetic of yeah. space and in ways of engaging the viewer beyond the virtual experience of image as window. His work undermines the neatness of the digital realm by introducing the unpredictability of the external world. I'm also dying to know where Soft Stuff, the name of his architecture studio, comes from, but we'll come to that later. Max Melville and Ashley Killa co-founded The Mock, a design-led architecture studio based in Cape Town with a focus on public space making and sustainable social impact architecture. Or as they call it, building useful public buildings and looking at communities as their real clients. Together with Alex, they created a plot, a virtual gallery space, and one of the artists they collaborated with is Rebecca Van Beek, who is an emerging artist and scenographer with a background in architecture. Her approach links across urban research, participatory design, spatial design, stage and costume design, and live and visual art. For the plot, Rebecca created a wonderfully self-conscious and bittersweet performance piece, which, to be honest, made me feel so, so nostalgic about my childhood and really better about myself for not making the most out of this global crisis, as my fellow millennials seem to be doing. <laughs> that being said, Rebecca, Alex, Max, Ashley. Great. Cool. Thank you, Alejandra and Matt, for the introduction. And uh, thanks to Agora for the invitation to talk. It's been great to see people from all different continents coming together during this time. Um, that was a great introduction. Um, so I guess I can skip past uh, doing much of that myself. Uh, just to say that. Um, Myself and Ashley and Max and Rebecca have known each other for quite a while and have uh, worked together on many things. As Alejandra mentioned, we're architects, but we're also um, interested in art projects, education, things around culture of architecture and art. So when the uh, COVID-19 pandemic hit us, we were really kind of faced with the, the challenge of how to remain active in architecture, you know, with building sites being closed, we wanted to take on a project that was kind of engaging the way in which we were all sitting at home and communicating with each other online. And how could we make something spatial out of that experience? Yeah. So in the beginning, what was kind of like really like piqued our interest was um, the the fact that dom the domestic interior um, within the world of architecture is really not taken very seriously. And we kind of thought, look, maybe this is the moment, you know, th this is the moment that we can actually start to bring the domestic interior to the, the kind of very serious um, conversation of architecture. But on the other side of that, with everyone being at home, um, what were the things that people could produce? What were the kinds of images? What were the kinds of tools that they had at their disposal to be able to be contributing towards a conversation around the um, domestic interior? So that was one kind of portion of what was in our mind. And the other portion uh, was definitely around what is the space of the internet? As in, I mean, mm. what can, well, nothing comes to mind when I think about that. And we really were challenged to or challenged ourselves to like spatialize this um, space of online communication. Yeah, so um, let me share some images. You'll be able to see it now? Yes. Yeah. Now, okay. we, now you're working. There we go. Yay, it, it, it might be an apt time to talk about <laughs> our non technocentric approach to <laughs> this whole project, which has been. <laughs> And kind of thinking about like, I mean, the stuff that we have, like the dumbest tools that we have at our disposal, our phones and things like Zoom and Google Maps, um, like that was the kind of stuff that we were interested in using. And, and like, this was everyone's world at the, at the start of COVID-19, seeing each other through um, a screen. Um, and like Ashley mentioned, um, 
the fact that we were all at home, we felt was an apt time to, to be talking about the domestic interior um, as the kind of new center for, for most of us. And the fact that also, I think the interior was becoming more public because of this, that we were obviously all peering into each other's homes. Um, and besides the, the kind of unique situation of the pandemic, just the fact that we generally uh, share these weird images of like ourselves and the food we eat and our home and probably, you know, have this clutter. I mean, this is a screenshot of my phone uh, and I, I'd imagine many people's look like this. You know, you've got a picture of chicken livers that you had two months ago and for some reason you don't end up deleting those images. So there's this kind of like overwhelming amount of representation of like our everyday lives and of our domestic interiors and like what could we do with that and um, we were we were also thinking a lot about the kind of um, the space of the internet as um, something more kind of physically um, physically spatial this is um, these are some images of uh, collages done by the experimental uh, architecture group Archizoom. And um, I mean, these were done pre-internet and they kind of speculated upon, you know, the future in which everyone would be infinitely connected and um, there, would the, there would be this kind of just infinite matrix of um, connectivity in the world in which we would all live as kind of uh, urban nomads. Um, and to an extent that we feel that the internet has kind of made that, that reality um, that kind of world a reality, but not maybe in the kind of spatial way that they predicted. So um, things that we found interesting were, I mean, I had a friend share a story of, of going on a Tinder date in the start of lockdown uh, with someone where they went through the Melbourne Art Museum on Google Maps. And to us, that was a really interesting experience in that it was, it was somewhat spatial. Um, but it was virtual and it was, again, using these tools that are commonly um, available and accessible like Google Maps and Zoom. Um, and so we, we felt that was really an opportunity for architects to kind of start engaging in that space. And just to add to that, I think what was definitely on our mind is that regardless of us being in isolation and being disconnected, we weren't disconnected um, through kind of virtual or we were connecting virtually. Um, and it was it was kind of we were trying to figure out how to still remain human within this new pandemic as in going on dates or how does business kind of carry on as usual, et cetera, in this space. Um, and that was kind of the framework of where we started our project. Um, and those were all the thoughts that were kind of going through our heads. Um, and I think if we go on to the next we can go on to that. Yeah. Um, so we then kind of got together and basically designed a virtual or a digital space um, with the architectural tools that we have um, in our architectural tool set. Um, we were quite, Alex said, we were, we were not necessarily technocentric in terms of we used what we had and any additions essentially were kind of a lo-fi addition of um, slight add-ins, et cetera, to make these new worlds that we were wanting to experience. Um, we also really were very, in creating this this kind of online gallery space, we were very um, kind of aware of how easily we, in this modern world of like scrolling, the continuous scroll um, and like too many clicks is too much effort. We were really like conscious about making whatever engagement from the um, user or from the submitter or viewer was going to be through familiar tools. So Instagram, um, Google Maps, and YouTube, et cetera, in terms of software. And then in terms of hardware, we, we really wanted it to be, um, or we designed it so that you you kind of access the space through your mobile phone or your, your cell phone, um, which essentially is an extension of your body as in if it's not with you, it's within reaching distance. Um, and that's essentially how we were all receiving news and um, images of the world and what was happening. Um, so that was kind of the like the background to it. Um, and then we designed a space that um, we, we, I suppose, in the, in the kind of um, the analogy of um, engagement and human interaction, we designed a cocktail party, um, a, a kind of a, an icebreaker between us, the internet, and the public, and how we all engage. 
And so this this world that we created um, was spatial, um, uh, but it was very much just a framework um, for a place of display. Um, it had this kind of sense of inf um, infinity and um, we really, we wanted it to, to be architectural and have like architectural language. So there's still this feeling of like floor and ceiling and column to keep this imaginary ceiling up. Um, but ultimately it was just, we didn't really know where we were going with this in terms of what it would come out as. Uh, but we just wanted it to be um, the beginning of something in terms of the cocktail party. How do we just start having that conversation with people? So the conversation essentially was an open call um, for anyone to submit their um, moments of um, interior life. Um, and they would submit it through our Instagram um, um, direct messages. Um, and now you see a couple of the um, highlights or, or kind of isolated images that people submitted. Um, and that would get posted onto our Instagram feed as people would send things in. We would then um, work on them and then curate them um, into the gallery space. Um, I think some of the points of interest that came from it, um, it was really weird to see how people wanted their, their parts of their interior moments as part of this public gallery next to other people's interior moments. Uh, I mean, we were, we were completely keen for it, but there is something kind of weird about that. Mm. Um, and it was amazing to see how, or it was interesting to see how it really appealed to some people. Like we had the serial submitters where people were just submitting over and over and over again. And we kind of, we had to sift through everything that they were submitting. Um, but what was interesting from that is that we kind of developed these these deep, or well, maybe not deep, but like um quite intimate relationships with these people through Instagram. Um, it's definitely something that I haven't done before, um, but it was a great way to understand how kind of the world is doing um, kind of basic meeting, etc. cetera. Um, I think that's yeah. all on that. Um, yeah, so this was kind of like a conversation starter, like um, Ash mentioned. I mean, we, we thought a bit about like, I mean, the fact that in, this case we're acting really as just hosts for a kind of conversation and the conversation is the interesting thing and we wanted to um stimulate that in a very open way in this initial round um and so we weren't too sure where this would go after this but we we knew that we wanted to kind of take it into um a bit of a deeper conversation um so some of our serial submitters or, or people that we were interacting with in that initial um round of, of engagement we wanted to invite some of them to to create work specifically for this online world um and in thinking of that we, we were really interested in the fact that um you know and as art, artists or architects working with material um what is the kind of uh materiality of of the online world and so we thought a, a lot about this idea of of like the electric light from screens actually being the the real material that you're confronted with as the viewer. Um, and then often that is quite an intimate experience, you know, like lying at night. Many of us um, have our phones uh, with us all the time. And, and often that kind of engagement is very, it's like small talk, you know, but sometimes it's also quite deep. Um, and we wanted to kind of delve into that world a bit. Um, so we were interested in creating settings more like a bedroom. If the, the first, you know, space was like a big public gallery. We wanted something a bit more intimate. Um, and we also wanted to play with the format of the image a bit more. I mean, we were thinking just about the format of the 360 image as something that um, is inherently not static, that it's a, an image that you view um, almost more like a Chinese scroll in the sense that you, you kind of read it, um, you know, sequentially. Um, and that this had the potential to uh, maybe have more narrative involved. So kind of switching from uh, seeing the image as a static thing to um, really uh, a kind of more of a performance or, or, you know, something that could unfold a narrative. And so we gravitated towards um, using 360 video as the format for the second round of performances and invited um, certain artists, uh, Rebecca being one of them, 
to uh, produce works for this world, which we call the electric blue bedroom. Um, this uh, and we termed to be a, a gallery for um, weird and intimate uh, performances of people's everyday. So um, I think we'll hand over to Rebecca to talk a bit about her performance, um, and then we can watch it. Uh, maybe you want watch to it watch first. Uh, yeah, let's maybe watch first. Okay. to give but lawyers say this love is best Um, yes, yeah, so the video, my experience of lockdown, as I think everybody's experience of lockdown, sort of went through such shifting moods. Um, and I found, I found sort of the, the sort of sensation of being in my room all the time, really isolating. Um, the project itself was linked to a larger body of work, which was called Patterns of Failure, uh, which was related to my master's in sonography, which I'm currently uh, almost, it's almost finished in London, which I'm completing in London, um, which questioned the idea of the costume, both as something that represents a character, but also conceals a character. Um, and how this was layered in terms of my own identity and sort of representing that, uh, and how this was so very much related to the space of my room, uh, as also um, through the occupation of this very small room uh, became sort of the, the studio, uh, but it also was a private space. So the video that I sent to the plot was the first was the first formalized export. Um, but then this grew, as I said, into a larger performative project. I was really interested in challenging a relationship online. Um, at theater school, having to complete a degree in theater design in lockdown was quite an interesting experience. Um, and through the project, I sort of challenged this uh, pressure to perform while performing um, and I think it was a really interesting experience for me working with the plot specifically in that 
Uh, video is something that I naturally gravitated towards because of the circumstances. Uh, and then having exported it as sort of a, a film to then give that over to Ashley, who translates into the 3D space. So it was over in that process, there was a, an aspect of co-creation as well, which was really interesting. Yeah, I mean, I could talk more about the project, but I think what I'll do is move on to our next collaboration. Uh, through this questioning of the online community, uh, how you connect to audiences uh, through your screen. I was also in parallel working on a, what, how do I call it? Like a, it's called a laboratory, but it's for students, design students to sign up and get information on various practical tools that we can use on our computers for various uh, reasons. And we structured it around a sort of two month program. Every two months, there was a different theme. And uh, the Mark, Ash, and Alex and Max uh, have been invited for the fourth module, which is on making. And we were really looking to equip participants with digital skills which included ourselves, because a lot of these things that we were learning were new to us as well, and also to challenge them and, and, crit and criticize them. And that's ongoing. Uh, so this was an example of a Zoom call using OBS, which sort of hacks the system a bit, uh, as we challenged how this screen in itself can become a protest space, can become an uh, informative space. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Cool. So thanks very much, Rebecca. Cool, um, so we'll share our screen again and um, we'll go into what we've prepared for um, the plot. Uh, sorry, um, Space Saloon. Yeah, this is um, when we were invited to uh, pre present a workshop um, for Satellite Lab. Um, we were again thinking how we could kind of push forward um, social communication online in a new way. Um, and in this case, I mean, there are participants from, uh, I think, every continent. Um, and how we could, I guess, get all of these participants to work together and also to kind of get a glimpse of perhaps what someone else's uh, perspective is on the other side of the world. So we, we started by setting up a kind of uh, campsite, this kind of virtual environment in which the workshop will be set. And again, there are references, certain architectural references to ArchiZoom, to Super Studio. But in this kind of setting, what we became interested in is the idea of atmospheres. So using the 360 image to kind of give someone else a glimpse into a particular atmosphere or a particular world that may not be, say, like conventionally like realistic, but may just give a sense of a mood. This is actually messing around with uh, a scourer, I think. We've also done experiments with flowers. So we also became, I think, at this stage, interested in using the 360 image in a way that was had less to do with rendering and, and modeling things, but maybe using it more in a kind of painterly way in this case, we're using the Street View app on our phones and we're just photographing things in 360 space. And this has become an, a new kind of working method for us that kind of brings a more analog feel to, to the, the environment and I think, yeah, is useful in, in kind of create, creating a tone that's maybe a bit more, I don't know, a bit more surreal um, than, than that of con conventional architectural space. And I suppose just to kind of wrap up and end off, we are super excited as we kind of get back into or as our worlds kind of open up again slowly but surely. Um, we're excited to kind of figure out and explore how these things that we've learned, these tools that we've, the, well, these, these skill sets that we have that we've used in different ways, how those come uh, and are reintegrated into um, the everyday kind of work that we do while that world will obviously never be the same in terms of what we go into now, um, it'll inter be interesting to see how we kind of learn across these different experiences that we've had and and what kind of gets produced from that. Yeah. Yeah, I think, I mean, we, we've always, I think, been aware of the fact that we consume a lot of culture through screens. 
but this has definitely made us think about uh, the way in which we do that um, and I think opened up new uh, possibilities of consuming art or, or any kind of culture online. And yeah, we're excited by the potential for architects to play a more active role in that world. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing and bring us back. Okay. Okay, <laughs> cool. All right, we're Thank you. Um, open Rebecca. to any questions. Yeah. Thank you. That was super thought provoking. Uh, we already have a question. Okay. And I think I'll start with that. We have a question in the chat from Lilia. I hope I'm pronouncing that okay. Uh, this is wonderful. Can you speak about the role of fashion in this interior lives? Hmm. An interior? Um... Uh, well, fashion is something we haven't actually had much mm. experience um, in. Mm. I mean, um, I guess there's a lot of potential for fashion. I mean, I don't know if any, I haven't watched any virtual mm -hmm. fashion shows during this, this mm -hmm. pandemic. Would it have? If we finish the way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't know. It's it's an interesting thing. I mean, I, I'd be interested to know, for instance, if there have been any, like, home, you know, fashion shows in the way that we've seen kind of home galleries been popping mm -hmm. up. Um, I'd be interested. I, I think one of the things that we're interested in just generally is the new level of intimacy that's coming up through this lockdown um, and the way in which people are engaging with technology. So mm -hmm. I think if I were to think of one thing that fashion you know, could potentially contribute would be a kind of more intimate take on um, the runway, you know, it'd be cool to see people doing that kind of thing from their home, to see different kinds of bodies um, on that kind of platform. Mm -hmm. I wonder, because there are many clothes, how many submissions of garments were there in terms of ma the material culture you populated uh, the, the plot not with? Many. Not many. Not many. Actually. Yeah, um, yeah. I don't actually think they were, I mean... Maybe we weren't calling for that in the right way, but that definitely was not the majority at all. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, it's interesting that we called mm -hmm. for kind of interior home moments and we got objects rather than like what was actually on clothing as bodies. Um, yeah. As in definitely one of the things that has come through in terms of lockdown has been the lounge way uh, in terms of fashion. Like I mean, <laughs> that's, it's exploded. <laughs> Um, so the fact that we didn't get any of those kinds of submissions is interesting. Yeah. Um, but Rebex, maybe do you a uh, costume fashion thoughts from your side? Yeah, I think it's a really interesting question. I mean, in my in my in my personal practice, I was really interested in challenging how we represent ourselves on the screen, and then what's left off of that as well. So. Um, in a lot of my work, I was I was sort of playing with the way that we dress for others, and how that uh, changes in a Zoom call as opposed to being in a physical space with someone. Um, I was very personally trying to sort of frame the costume making process as actually a participatory uh, performance which sort of had two challenges. First, the actual garment. So if, if that was considered as a fashion, not really. I mean, they were, they were meant to be quite ridiculous forms. But this question of what even a costume is became important. So is this a costume? Is this a costume? Um, and how I feel that, you know, the, the space of a Zoom call can be sometimes really uncomfortable um, and quite daunting and also exhausting and I felt like as the person behind the lens it was almost more important to challenge how we act rather than what the screen is doing um, how we can sort of present ourselves in a more relaxed or comfortable way uh, so that then other people on a call might feel the same and whether what we wear influences that um, yeah I read, I read you said uh, somewhere, I don't know where exactly, because I, as I was researching you, you said that you're increasingly interested in how to leverage an experience as a way of freeing creative output and embracing mistakes, similar to the marks a child makes. <laughs> and I find that really interesting. I'm wondering, I mean, no, we don't know how to make costumes. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's such a... <laughs> Me neither. Me neither. <laughs> I know how to sew. Um, but just the basics, I have a sewing machine. My mother taught me how to sew, which is also a whole conversation in itself. But um, I, 
the, the project came out of an earlier work, which was in a physical space with actual participants. Um, and I had a whole series of fabrics and I was asking people to dress either myself or somebody else. Um, and just through very sort of tangible skills like sticking masking tape or, or cutting shapes and so very rudimentary uh, positioning them on the, the figures. And then to, to so, sort of switch that over to Zoom initially, I was really disappointed and, and quite, um, yeah, I, I was stuck. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know how to suddenly take this into an online platform. And I, I then very simply asked a group of friends to come onto a Zoom call and then tell me what to do instruct mm -hmm. me yeah so rather than doing it themselves I was sort of the the puppet and they got mm -hmm. to say oh could you add this could you change this and it was so much fun um afterwards somebody actually said that it felt like therapy um and I suddenly had the switch where I, where I saw the opportunity of online engagement as linking to parts of the world that then in a normal situation would never have connected to this project whatsoever. So I was sort of calling friends in South Africa while I was in London. Um, and yeah, just do whatever, trust your instinct and see what comes out of it. And uh, there was meant to be, it was meant to be quite lighthearted. It was meant to be something that was uh, freeing in this quite isolating, depressing, uh, difficult time. Yeah. Um, you know, it's all fun and games. I mean, we, you talk about it as if it's fun, but I think it's work. <laughs> I think it's, you may call it, I mean, we made work sound fun. We, Claybor, isn't that a concept that we talk about? Yeah, yeah. But what you're doing is work. How do you, re, how do you, what do you think about that? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I feel like everybody can, can respond. It's, I had a very specific need to work. I had to, put together an online exhibition for a master's yeah. degree. Um, and I think that question becomes uh, somewhat more complicated when you consider uh, sort of producing art for yourself uh, without necessarily having any funding. Um, and I think that's now, because I've just finished the degree, I'm really starting to uh, challenge at what point or how much time do you have to give towards something when it's just enjoyable versus when it can actually sort of help uh, find you work. Yeah. Paid work. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How about you? What, I mean, there must have been a lot of work in creating the plot or everything that you do that you've shown us. Yeah. Well, I mean, I guess it was the weird situation again of the pandemic. I think that also like people, and, you know, I remember going to hardware stores and, and people were like, everyone had some kind of DIY project that they were mm. like, imagining Stuffing keeping themselves well. busy mm. with. Like, I, I felt like in that initial stage, um, everyone, for some reason, felt like, okay, they're going to focus on the stuff that they never get a chance to to do. Yeah. Um, and I think maybe we were kind of riding off of that energy. And, and we are now, I think, thinking about how we can use the plot as a, maybe a kind of service or, or you know, um, I don't think we want to monetize it in the way of like using it, um, it, it as a way of selling art online, but um, I think it has the potential to, to kind of be a business in itself. But we, it definitely was a, like something that came out of passion. And I think that initial stage in which everyone felt like, let's do something really cool because we're all sitting at home and we have mm -hmm. the time and let's make the most of it. You know? I think I, there's also, sorry, one more no. point. I think there's also this critique of the expectations set. So I think at the beginning of lockdown, mm -hmm. everyone was so aware of all these creatives doing creative things. Yeah. Um, and it was really difficult to follow along when you were just sitting in your room playing some stupid game on your iPad. Um, <laughs> and I think, in my project, I was very conscious of sort of criticizing that, going like, what is good enough to show? Um, yeah. And even though I might have expected to have produced something that was of a better craft quality, like it would have had a better sort of output as an object, 
it almost became less relevant mm. and on the screen it was sort of like the action and the sort of engagement working with other people sure there were fabrics and we made some like weird and wonderful costumes afterwards but it was that process was more important than the than the final um product which helped me feel more comfortable making work actually well it is an alternative form of value production isn't it performance yeah I mean, they call friendship sacrificial economy. You're all friends, right? You've known each other for, yeah. <laughs> for a while. <laughs> In which pain is absorbed easier into the body. <laughs> the pain of yeah, yeah, yeah. So how do you, I mean, how long have you been friends for? And when did you start collaborating? We all About studied together, years. yeah. yeah. Ten, ten years ago, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> we all survived architecture school. Yeah. <laughs> and then went off and did different things. I also wonder about, I mean, the way we experience art online is mostly through a white cube that is doubled by the white field of the browser. And I've always mm. been really dissatisfied with that, to be honest. And mm. I, I'm always excited to see different exhibitions. I mean, the exhibition format reinvented. And I think you're doing that quite well. Mm -hmm. um, how do you experience art online? Do you like it? Do you? Um. Yeah, well, I, th I think the, the, the white cube um, phenomenon that you spoke of is interesting in that, um, I mean, I, I definitely, like, I, I understand the critique behind it in that, like, you know, kind of having this really sanitized, like, clean white environment um, creates a context in which I, I think you can almost kind of proclaim anything as, as being art, you know, like the white yeah. cube is very filled with a sheep or anything um decontextualizing it in that way um makes you see it in a different way and, and and also then kind of maybe changes your perception of it of its value um and i think similarly online you know uh, there are people who i i guess you you can make an object and photograph it well and it, it may look photogenic and on life on online it may um have a, a value that it doesn't have in real life and so that kind of white cube effect, I think, is interesting um, and maybe in a way problematic. But in a way, I also think you can't you can't escape it. Um, but what what I think there could be is just maybe more um, like more alternatives. You know, the white cube mm -hmm. isn't a way of viewing art. Um, so right. I think we're really interested in um, different kinds of gallery spaces. I mean, there's a gallery in Cape Town that's just opened um, inside an apartment, which we find really interesting. It's someone again, um, kind of showing art in the context in which many people uh, kind of see it in a, in a more intimate setting. And that's that's really interesting. It's the kind of opposite of the white cube. It's, it's with other stuff and it's with a kind of visual clutter um, that totally changes your, your reading of it. Um, and mm -hmm. I just think, uh whatever it is i think that there could just be more there should be more options mm. absolutely um, also if i could just add and go back to the online aspect of your question in terms of engaging with art i think one of the frustrating things um that i definitely felt with kind of going into lockdown and pandemic and isolation etc was kind of uh, we had started conversations about like online like virtual space and then things galleries were popping up as well but they were popping up in the way that the real world gallery exists in terms of it was a it was a, a virtual tour through the existing gallery space, you mm. know, as in they 3D photographed mm -hmm. and then made virtual. And it was so frustrating to like kind of <laughs> have the real world in this digital world that has all this opportunity, but it was just replicating mm. exactly what existed, you know. And I, I I mean I'm proud of us for trying to challenge that and go, you know, there's opportunity and kind of um like it, place to explore within the digital and virtual worlds. And, and that's what we definitely try to do as a not replicate um, what exists in the physical world online, but actually mm. let online be online in its own way mm. with its own rules kind of thing. Yeah, I can relate also in terms of the theatre industry, um, having, having it shut down a lot of theatre, uh, mm. a lot of theatres then started uh, uploading archival material of old productions mm -hmm. and it's just not the same 
I just I felt that you know to to take a front on filmed video of a theater production and copy and paste that into YouTube needs to be entirely rethought. You have mm-hmm. to sort of you have to edit things, um, make them more appropriate for online attention spans, possibly mm-hmm. reshoot, possibly think about um, how to record the, the 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 performance in the first place as well. I wonder, mm-hmm. I think that after this, when we come out of lockdown and hopefully, fingers crossed, the theatre industry kind of re, re-flourishes, but um, that production houses will be more aware of the need to record things in a certain way mm-hmm. um, and mm-hmm. archive uh, performances in a, in a certain light because I, I, I do think that there's a lot of opportunity in representing these things online because you, you can then reach a different audience um, but I don't think that I don't think that designers or pro- producers are considering that enough. Mm-hmm. I think also on that as in what makes us so excited as well in terms of coming as spatial practitioners into this world that we've created we've also realized the kind of the legs that this world that we've created can go into so I mean in South Africa, we have a national arts festival um, where it's kind of like it's 10 days worth of, I think it's something like 600 performances mm-hmm. in one town. It's, it's that crazy. It's, it's mad. It's on the calendar. It's, it's a big event. And they had to go completely, or they chose to go completely um, virtual this year. And we contacted them to say, you know, like, Flip, we can make these spaces that your performers can kind of inhabit and reimagine um like how does this develop together and unfortunately the conversation didn't go much further i think they were kind of in panic mode of they just had yeah. to get something out you know yeah. so hopefully next year or kind of in the coming time we, we have opportunities to take these these really amazing opportunities of these virtual worlds into things like performance and what is i mean it would also be even interesting to kind of in a kind of a more kind of from the beginning collaborative way, do something again with like Rebecca in terms of understanding this 360 space. How do we together film something, you know, um, that actually responds to the space? I mean, it sounds like it might get very mm. technical, um, but surely there's opportunity within that to, yeah. to be creating new kinds of um, like theatre as well. But it's interesting that we got to the performances. I mean, that's actually how I think we ended up going with the, or developing this electric blue bedroom was was thinking about mm. how we could, because the theater industry in South Africa was having to start doing virtual festivals and stuff. At that time, we, we were very focused on how we could kind of respond to that. Mm. Yeah. Um, I have a question for the educators in you. Um, sure. As educators and I think talented gatherers, how do you create a trustful space and host the space so that others can find freedom in it? Mm. Yeah. Uh, well, I think Rebecca's it's a big question. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna. My response is that that the, the lab, the satellite lab, what we're which we're running currently, is trying to answer that question. Yeah. Um, the first week was actually sort of bringing on the table. Uh, options for video chats <laughs> mm-hmm. there was sort of question one how do we do the video <laughs> chat um and there's also this realization that there are so many useful platforms that exist already and it's about understanding them and understanding their capabilities and also knowing that it takes time for people to feel comfortable in any sort of environment so even yeah. just uh building familiarity with the participants who are part of the lab has taken a couple of weeks and now that we've uh, sort of had continuous conversations with them much more uh, sort of contributions are coming forward and the other thing I think is just breaking up the the intensity of of the number of participants we found that breakout groups on zoom that zoom definitely does the best breakout groups but Zoom has recently been struggling with, with um, connectivity problems and Google Meet is better. But <laughs> these are technical <laughs> issues. But, but the breakout rooms we found have also made a, a huge difference for the way that students engage because suddenly you're in a group with only three people rather than 20 plus and you're then much more comfortable talking and, and, and contributing. It's complicated because I think that as an educator in this time, 
you realize how much an in-person engagement makes a difference to the way that students learn and the way that you enjoy your 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 job as a teacher. Um, but unfortunately, it looks likely that there'll be online teaching for at least until December. And I think a lot of the conversations are, how can we do the same? And I think the conversations yeah. are, what should we be doing completely differently? And what can we also, on the other hand, continue to do as if it, as if we were in, a, in, a, in the same space? <laughs> what were the recurring themes you noticed in your submissions for the plot? I'm assuming in terms of the moments, interior moments you... Yeah. Um, I mean, in this initial round, I mean, I think... Like like ornamental stuff next to your bed kind of thing. I mean... It really varied so much. I, I mean, I, I wouldn't even say that, that there was any kind of consistency. I, I mean, in the way that like people are so different. I mean, we had yeah. people sharing their jars of weed from you know <laughs> their a fish they caught yesterday. Um, it was a pink yeah. fish. This <laughs> fish, not a yeah. pink cat. Yeah. Lord is the like, just... <laughs> oh, yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, to arts, to I, I mean, it, yeah, I think sentimental things you know with things that like people were sharing but they varied so much I mean um I think though I mean it was kind of it definitely did indicate I mean, as if people took it personally they yeah, shared like personal yeah. things that were like close to them it wasn't like people were just I mean taking a picture of anything it was like in terms of you know how they took the photo maybe wasn't as like considered but there definitely was consideration in terms of this is something that I hold close to me yeah. or, or I value and I want to share it with the world. So, I mean, I'm just, yeah, we, it, it definitely was like, you know, someone went fi or had previously gone fishing and they sent this fish and that was a big moment for them. Um, there was someone who's like flower mad and sent flower stuff, you yeah. know, so it was, it was very like particular to the people, I think. And yeah, and I think that's, I mean, we definitely were, hoping for that I mean we, we weren't hoping for that kind of like really beautifully kind of shot mm. and like put together scenes that maybe don't reveal uh the reality of people's yeah, homes you know honest, yeah. yeah it's almost like the virtual version of uh, the museum of broken relationships where you take an object you received from someone that <laughs> and then you give it but it's a virtual way of it's very interesting I yeah. Love it. yeah 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 we also have it as a uh, almost like a virtual what do you call it exquisite, exquisite corpse that like you know <laughs> one person does something and you like the work. surrealist thing. yeah yeah i have another question do you think the internet this internet platform will be a temporary thing or maybe it can develop further regardless easing the restrictions i think we definitely want it to be a thing that continues mm -hmm. in the future i mean i don't think we were also just talking about the fact that like we we definitely consume a lot of architecture online. I mean, a lot of, you know, I think it's it's maybe kind of more direct with like the visual arts that you can kind of look at a painting online and have a kind of authentic experience, but it's quite difficult to re replicate something spatial online. Um, so I think we would like to kind of push that. And, and I think that there's definitely room for that going forward. It's not a... Mm -hmm. It's not a unique thing to this moment that people are looking mm -hmm. at uh, cultural content online. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I I predict a, a hybrid. I think that there will be in-person engagement, and then because of all the things that we've learned in this time, I would hope that there is a, an, a, a virtual output that has far more a, sort of a dynamic uh, nature to it. Mm -hmm. Sort of the two working. Uh, more co concurrently than what's mm -hmm. usually the situation where you have like one thing and then mm -hmm. the documentation, but rather mm -hmm. having the, the the virtual space as something mm -hmm. live mm -hmm. as well. Yeah, yeah. I think I mean if we also acknowledge that uh, virtual experience is just a part of our lives and mm -hmm. it's a very real yeah. experience, then uh, let's not like see it as something separate from reality. Absolutely. I have another question. Someone is interested. What are your main sources of inspirations for digital art in terms of artists, media, galleries? Oh, that's it. So many. Um, <laughs> this well, is I, precedent, man. Here you go. Here you go. Uh, well, I think the, the plot in particular, um, there, there were, I think, a certain group of artists and architects that we were definitely influenced by. Um, and the kind of 1970s uh, experimental architecture um, 
in which there was a lot of uh, kind of speculation about the future of technology in society mm-hmm. and like speculation about like worlds of yeah infinite connectivity. But it was also at the stage where technology was more clunky than it is now. And uh, we kind of liked that, you know, the fact that it was, you know, something like the internet uh, before it existing, the only way someone could probably imagine it was through like a, an actual physical grid extending over the world. And so that's that's more interesting to us than this kind of um, intangible thing that we now know as the internet, you know. Uh, so I think, yeah, early experimental um, architecture in 1970s and then artists uh, like I think Pippa Lotti Rist, uh, the vi- video artist, um, definitely found very interesting in terms of like performance that is um, really intimate. And like, I think she's someone who pushes video art um, in a way that like, she always uses like contemporary pieces of technology, but like not in a, in a high tech kind of way. And, and we really like that approach. Well, thank you. We have another question. <laughs> Why, what are your thoughts about digital versus virtual? <laughs> I think there was a time where I actually I Googled um, yeah. and I came, there was a paper, literally there was an entire paper that I, I mean, I skimmed through it. But um, I think for, I mean, I, I almost would say that in digital, like we've been working digitally always. Well, not always, as, an, yeah. as architects, young mm-hmm. architects, we've yeah. been working digitally, you know. I mean, none of our, unfortunately, I mean, well, none of the spaces that we create now um, are like, Virgins of digital space. They kind of they are always digital and then go into physical space. Mm-hmm. Everyone is using kind of com- computer generated stuff now. Um, but I think the virtual is the kind of the, the immersive, experiential. Um, it's another world on its own that we don't. It's it's the mm-hmm. it's the non physical world that is experiential in digital space. It, for me, is the virtual world. I don't know yeah. You, yeah, yeah. I guess maybe. Maybe it implies like it being virtual is, is like as opposed to being uh, real, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I think even when we were coming up with the title of the talk, we were like debating whether to use the word digital mm-hmm. or virtual, and we settled on digital because uh, we didn't want to imply that this was like something at, like apart, like set aside from reality. You mm-hmm. know? Mm-hmm. And it was, I mean, in that way, I think the the fact that we used Google Maps to geolocate some of the the beginning um, work that we did, like, I mean, Rebecca mm-hmm. was saying yesterday, like, it was so weird, like, you kind of, you went into Instagram, you clicked onto this link to a place, yeah. but the place wasn't actually the physical place, like, what was this thing that I was looking at, you know, like, it was kind of this, like, cryptic play between yeah. the, between the physical um, and the the digital and the virtual in that way. Yeah, and and it would have been different if you if you sent someone a link to just I don't know like a virtual yeah. uh, gallery viewing room, they wouldn't have like had that expectation mm-hmm. of it being mm-hmm. like a real place. You know? Do we have other questions? <laughs> oh, I have an answer to this one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, is there another question? What is the role that the art market uh, plays on artists' creativity um, in your personal experience? Have you been influenced? Um, I, I just, I think there's two things. There's the the platform for art and then there's the art itself. Um, and I think that the art market in this time has a responsibility for questioning that platform. And mm-hmm. I, I personally don't feel like I've seen enough. Um, I think... In, in times where you are sort of quite restricted in terms of your movement and also in terms of your access to various resources, um, the artist responds through their work, but then the gallery, the collectors, and the, uh, yeah, the, 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 the market, I think, could be more active in the way that they question the way that that, that work is presented and facilitated, which I think is what the plot did. Uh, quite successfully so um yeah but i wonder in terms in terms of platform capitalism i mean they're monopolizing the internet as well Mm. how do you i mean is there a way to make it not get buried in you know Mm. between all the 
pace gathering, whatever, yeah. virtual initiatives that are all it's a delirium, really. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I think art can also contribute to that that mess. Um, yeah. And and maybe that's just part of the part of the ride. Yeah, it's so, it's so it's so difficult sometimes when you try to subvert something. As a result of doing it differently, you then don't uh, receive any att any attention, which is also maybe part of the intention of the art. But it's there's a there's a problem there. Yeah, <laughs> there's, there's definitely. A... <laughs> I mean, it capitalizes even from forms of resistance. If you know what I'm trying to. Yeah. Yeah. Are there? Oh, oh yes. Mm. Is this a question? <laughs> Oh no, it's it's a it's a reflection. <laughs> okay. What would your goals be with this concept for the rest of 2020? Um yeah, we, we have some new uh projects in the pipeline. Um and I think definitely one of the things that's been a goal for for us from the start is to have some kind of physical manifestation once uh, you know lockdown restrictions ease off to um, we still very much like working physically and, and you know with physical space so we would like to move into kind of that kind of engagement and um, you know using this platform as a, as a resource I don't know that kind of hybrid thing that Rebecca spoke of is, is kind of what we're trying to to go for okay great well so uh Right before we finish, we're going to leave you with some music from uh, Sam, who's uh, created a piece uh, specifically for this. So the, the work that Sam's written for this talk is named Kere, and it's a musical segment for the Agora Forums that deals with art and architecture. The title of the piece comes from Francis Kere, a Berlin-based architect from the African village of Gando. So um, we'll sign off and, and leave you to listen to that. Thank you so much for joining us at our Immersive Atmospheres event. We look forward to seeing you at our next one. So I'll, um, I'll pass you over to Sam to play that music and thank you from all of us thank you thank you